What's up everybody and welcome to a new video series. In this series we're going to code a decision tree classifier from scratch. And by from scratch I mean not using sklearn, but instead we're going to use numpy and pandas. So it's not totally from scratch. And the specific algorithm we're going to implement looks like this. In the theory behind this algorithm we are, we've already discussed in the previous video series which was called what is machine learning. And I will put the links to the two respective videos into the video description. So preferably you make sure that you understand all the concepts that we dis uh, discussed in these videos and then it should be relatively easy to follow along. And now to give you a quick overview of what we're going to do in this series, in this first video, which is just an introduction, we're going to load our data, which is again the Iceflower dataset, and we're also going to uh, transform it into the right format for our decision tree algorithm. And then we're also going to split our data into a training and testing data set because, as you may remember from one of the videos in the video description, before we started our analysis, we randomly picked 20 flowers out of the 150 that we had, and those served as our first test case. With them, we could check if the patterns that we found in the analysis were actually valid and really help to distinguish the different types of flowers. And we're going to build a function that does this separation for us. And then in the next couple of videos, we're going to build all those helper functions. And then in the video after that, we're going to use those functions to create the actual decision tree algorithm, which then should be able to create such a decision tree from our data. And then in the following video, we're going to build a function that uses that tree to classify new unknown flowers. And then in the last video of the series, we're going to make some changes to those functions and the algorithm so that it can also handle categorical data. And that way, we can apply this algorithm to any kind of data set and not just data sets that only consist of continuous variables like the iris flower data set. And before I start, however, I quickly want to mention that I consider myself to be still a beginner at programming. So like Zentex caught one of his Q and A's, this video series is more of a don't worry, be hacky approach. And Zentex is one uh, someone who creates videos about programming in Python. And I will put the link to that video in the description as well. And now we can finally start. And the goal of our video series is, so to say, to create such an API, where we first read in our data into a pandas data frame, which is conventionally named df. And then we're also going to have to get it into right format for our algorithm. And I will talk about in a moment what that format looks like. And then you only have to run those three lines of code, where we first split our data frame into the training and testing data frame, and then we run the decision tree algorithm on the training data to create our tree. And then finally, we calculate an accuracy to see how good that tree classifies new unknown flowers. In this way, simply by changing the name of the file that you're reading in, you can run this algorithm on a whole new data set. And this uh, now is so this is the end result we're aiming for. And therefore, we obviously have to first make our import statements to import the libraries that we're going to need. So first, we're going to import numpy as np and pandas as pd. And those are the two main libraries that we're going to use to build all those functions. And then we're also going to import matplotlib.pyplot as plt and seaborn as sns. And those are two plotting libraries. And we're going to use them to create some plots to see if the functions that we built are actually doing what we want them to do. And then we're also going to make use of a line magic, which is something inherent to this Jupyter Notebook environment and which is denoted by this percent sign. And here we're going to say matplotlib inline. And this just makes sure 
that the plots that we create are actually displayed in this notebook. And then we also go to import random, which we're going to use for our train testbed function. And then finally, from pretty print, we're going to import pretty print. Just to make sure that the tree that we create is displayed in such a way that is easy to read and understand. So now we can start with the first part of our API, which is to load and prepare our data. So just like here at the top, we're going to say df equals pd read csv and the file is called iris. And now let's have a look what that looks like by using the data frame method head, which by default displays um, the first five rows of our data frame. So this is what it looks like. And here we can see that there are six columns and actually this ID column uh, we don't need because it doesn't provide any useful information. So we're going to drop it by saying df equals df drop id and we're going to set the access argument to one so that this method looks for this id string along the columns and not along the rows. So if I run this cell then now this column should be gone and it is. So this now is the data that, you, that we are going to work with. So we now only have to get it into the right format for our decision tree algorithm. And here I've already written down what that format looks like. And there are basically just two conditions. The first one is that we need, or that the last column of the data frame must contain the label and it must also be called the label. And this condition is almost already met by our data frame because the species column is the label for this data set. So we only have to rename it to label. And we do that by saying df equals df rename. And we want to rename one of the columns. And the column that we want to rename is the species column to label. So now this last column should be called label. So, and it is. So the first condition of the format is already fulfilled. And now the second is that there should be no missing values in the data frame. And we can check for that by saying uh, df.info, for example. And here we can see that there are 150 entries in total in this data frame. And each column has 150 non-null items. So there are no missing values. So both conditions of the format are fulfilled. And this means we can now start to create our first function, which is the train test split function. So let's uh, create another heading for that. And let's just write train test split. And let's also call the function simply train test split. And the input for this function, or one input for this function, obviously, is our data frame. And the other input is the test size, which simply states how big our test data frame should be. And then this function should simply output a training data frame and a test data frame. And the idea how this function should work is basically that we say, OK, we have this data frame and from this data frame we want to randomly select a certain number of rows which then constitute our uh, test data frame and since each row has a specific index which is depicted here at the front what we basically want to do is we want to randomly pick numbers from this index and we can access the index by saying df.index and since this returns a range index object which we don't want, we transform it uh, to a Python list by using the toList method. And this now creates a Python list that contains all the indices from our data frame. So let's store this list into a variable called 
um, indices. And now from those indices, we want to randomly pick a certain number of indices, which then constitute our test data frame. So that's why we imported the random module because it has a function that does ex exactly that. And it's called sample. And this takes in a population. And in our case, those are the indices. And that's also the reason why we transformed them to a list because the sample function can't operate on such a range index. And then the second argument for this function is the K argument, which simply, uh, which is simply the number of elements that we want to sample from this population. So in our case, that's the test size. So let's say for now that this test size is 20. So if I run this cell, then we should get a list with 20 random numbers that were sampled from the from those indices. So let's see if that's the case. And as we can see, those numbers seem to be pretty random. And this now are these uh, numbers now are obviously our test indices. So let's store them in the variable that is called that way. And those test indices we can now use to create our test data frame simply by indexing our input data frame. And we do that by saying df.log brackets. And this log attributes attribute allows us to access only uh, certain rows. And the rows that we want to access have those test indices. So we simply pass in our test indices. And then to create our training data frame, we simply um, drop those test indices. And this now is basically our train test bit function, but I would like to add one more functionality to it to make it a little bit more flexible. Namely, what I want to do is one should be either able to pass in a certain number of rows that one wants to have for the uh, test data frame. So like here, uh, the example is 20, or one should be also be able to pass in a proportion. So that one is able to say, okay, I want to have 10% of my data to be my testing data. So we have to build in something into this function that tests if that test size is an actual number or if it is a proportion. And since we don't have to change anything about the test size, if it is an exact number of rows, we're going to check if this test size is a proportion. So if it is a float and we do that by saying if is instance test size float. And if it is a float or a proportion, then we have to calculate the number, the number of rows that that proportion represents. So we're going to do that by saying test size equals test size, which is a proportion times the length of our data frame. So times the length, uh, times the number of rows. And since this new product could be another float, so for example, 5.6, we're going to round this number because you can't sample 5.6 rows from the data frame. So this K argument has to be an integer. And this now is our train test split function. So let's copy it and paste it into our definition of the function. And now let's see if it works as we intended to. So let's say, so we write train df and test df equal train test split and we pass in our data frame and we set the test size to 10 percent. And now since we have a total of 150 rows in this data frame, the length of our test data frame should be 15 because uh, 10 percent of 150 are 15. So let's see if that's the case. And indeed it is. Okay. And now let's set the test size to 20 
and let's have a look at the first five rows of our test data frame. So now we have those specific flowers. And if I now run this te train test split function again, so if I create a new test data frame, then this new test data frame should co uh, contain different flowers. So the indices should be different. And that's because we want to randomly sample from our indices. So let's see if that's the case. And indeed the numbers are different. And now um, to make sure that you can follow along and that you get the same results as I do in the upcoming videos, I'm going to set a random seed for this cell. And this makes sure that we always get the same pseudo random numbers when we run this function. So for example, when I set the C to zero, the first three rows have the indices 98, 107 and 10. So if I run this function now again and create again a new test data frame, then this new test data frame should have the same indices as the one before. So let's see if that's the case. And indeed the numbers are the same. So let's cut those cells. So now uh, our train test split function seems to be working properly. And now we can start to build our second function, which is the actual decision tree algorithm. And therefore we need to obviously first build those helper functions. And this will be the topic of the upcoming videos. So thanks for watching and hopefully I will see you in the next videos.